Action effects will inevitably be obsolete when the best new thing comes out. That happens with digital gear. Buy my plugins. They're awesome. Apparently, plugins are not digital. Don't become obsolete. At least in this guy's head. By the way, the dude, the price of an action effects for the hundreds of amp models plus hundreds of effects and all that running options you could use along with your portability of it don't even come close to the fortune you would pay to get all that plugin for me and still need a laptop. Just give up that argument. Good modeling gear like Fractal Gear is miles ahead of analog hardware and is obviously the future of guitar tone. Yo, I'm looking at your comment here and I'm kind of scratching my head. Where exactly did I say plugins will never be obsolete? Did you get that fact where you get most of your facts and that's from pulling it out of your ass? Hey everybody, welcome to SMG Viewers Comments, my Friday show where I try and answer your comments and questions about recording, music, general stuff like that. To the best of my ability, welcome to episode number 273. It's really great you guys could join me. I'm shooting this on, what, Wednesday the 8th. This is the day after Eddie Van Halen died, and I figure... Okay, let's talk about Van Halen here for a minute because, I mean, come on. Eddie Van Halen belongs in the same breath as Jimi Hendrix. I mean, he was just that level of guitar player. It's very unfortunate that he's passed away. It's very sad to see him go. He was a brilliant player. Uh, I remember my ex earliest experience with Van Halen would probably be the jump video when I was about 13 years old. You know, when the, the album 1984 came out, that was just massive. And then I remember starting high school at age 14, somebody had left a copy of Van Halen 1 over at our house, and my brother would crank up side one of Van Halen 1 every single morning. And it was awesome. Da, 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 you know, that's just, just absolutely amazing. What a, what a brilliant player. What a genius level guitar player. What an amazing innovator. Uh, the world is a sadder place without him. Thank you, good sir, for all the brilliant music. Uh, you were one of a kind, and you will be heavily missed by all of us. Okay, now I'm going to get to the questions before I start crying like a little girl. Ugh, technology has come to make lives easier. I don't understand folks insisting on remaining in the Stone Age. Eugene, buddy, let me lay it out for you in a way that even you can understand. See, I was just talking about growing up with Van Halen 1, and here, there's a reason why 30 years later I still have very fond memories of that record, and there's a still reason why people still listen to it all these years later after it came out, because it was art, and it was great art. There's a big difference between an amazing painting from somebody like, say, Frank Frazetta or H.R. Giger or somebody like that, and then paint by numbers. One is art, one is not. Auto-tune, as referenced in your comment here, where me and Henning Pauly destroyed the fuck out of an auto-tune, you know, takes the art out of the hands of the creators and puts it on rails and turns it into paint by fucking numbers! Am I making myself clear? Is this getting through to you? If you want your music to suck, put auto-tune on it. It's guaranteed. Nobody's gonna give a fuck about it. If you put a human performance on your record, one where the singer is putting everything he's got into the performance to get the notes where they needed to be, that at least is going to give you a fighting chance of somebody actually appreciating what the fuck you're trying to get across. So please, stop trying to fucking be mediocre and start trying to be amazing. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys in on something, trying something a little bit different. I went to go hang out with Chris Lipe there a few days ago in Denver, and uh, he was working with a live switching system, and he said it really speeds up his whole editing process, and I thought, hey, you know what, I should try doing that, so I'm gonna try working with a little bit of OBS. I'm taking the camera, into a OBS feed and I'm also pulling up the screen caps right here on the screen. I'm gonna try switching back and forth. Hopefully I don't screw this thing up too badly and I remember where the hell I am. So here we go with the next uh, piece of amazing wisdom. Oh man, poor guys have only heard high gain saturated tube. It's just like comparing explosion sounds one each other. You won't notice any differences while they are already noise. Tube differences are noticed in rock, blues, jazz, M. I've changed tubes and noticed a huge difference in the sound, but saying there isn't a difference because you don't hear it on those fully saturated tubes does not make any sense. Much like your statement there, Carlos, really didn't make any difference. I love that. Oh, I've heard huge differences. Where's your evidence? That's the thing I don't see much of. Where's your null test? Again, this is just somebody pulling something out of their ass. Is it purchase validation? More than likely. Now, this is a thing we got. I did that video a couple weeks ago where I said, you know, changing your tubes out really doesn't make a huge difference. 
And uh, it was pretty interesting. There were, there were a lot of opinions and uh, not a lot of evidence towards anything. So I thought that was very, very cool. Uh, the consensus seemed to be that changing power tubes won't make a big difference. Changing your preamp tubes might, but how much of a difference it makes uh, really remains to be seen. Now, I've been working on my testing methodology. I'm going to probably start shooting this episode uh, this weekend or on Monday or something like that. I'm getting a bunch of different tube amps together, and I love that. You guys have only heard high-gain saturated tubes. Well, no, we haven't, numbnuts. I've got a 1966 Trainer YB1A that I'm going to be swapping tubes out because it's got the original Philips tubes in, which are American-made and apparently, you know, really worth a lot. Well, and the big thing is, oh, cheap Chinese tubes. Well, I'm going to change the preamp tubes in that from the original Philips to the cheap Chinese, and we're going to see what happens on a clean sound. Will that get Carlos to shut the fuck up? Time will tell, but survey says no! Now, we're also going to run that test in a couple of other amps as well. Uh, probably my Marshall valve state, because I just want to hear how much preamp tubes really do make a difference, because that's got a solid state power section. Possibly my second 5150 that doesn't have a bias mod. And uh, I'm also going to call up my very good friend Steve Chason, who happens to have a 1954 Fender. And we're going to bring that in and swap a few tubes out and see what happens. So that way we're going to run the whole gamut of everything from super clean amps to you know, modern high gain and try and create a database for you guys to go check out and see, hey, here's what's going on. I want this video to have value to the guitar community and not just be an opinion piece. Go from a JJ12AX7 to an EHX and tell me there's no difference. It's night and day. JJs are super dark and EHX are shrill and brittle. Martin Allen, I had the opposite effect in my JCM2000. The EHX were dark and muddy and the JJs were a lot brighter but smooth. This. This is exactly the kind of bullshit that's going on with tubes in the guitar community. It's like one person says one thing, one person says another thing. And I'm just wondering how much of it actually is a placebo effect. I mean, like, obviously, if you're going to take your amp apart, drop in a bunch of tubes, you know, spend the money, all that crap. You want to get something for your efforts. The big question is how much of a difference is it really making? I want to know, and I'm sure a bunch of you guys want to know, so please make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, so you guys get notified when that video comes out, because I think it's going to turn a lot of heads. Much in the same way when I did Is the Sound Really in the Hands, and we, we did that test. We did four players, and we isolated just the player. We had the same guitar, same string, same pick, same riff, same everything, and same settings on the amp, and turns out the sound is not in the hands. It's pretty much where you put the mic and how you tweak the gear. Uh, the player of the clarity of the playing is in the hands, but the actual tone, the actual where it sits in the audio scape on a mix is definitely by how you set up the gear. A lot of people didn't like that result. I was shocked as hell. I always thought the tone was in the hands too until we gathered evidence to prove otherwise. And, you know, people still argue that to this day. Oh, you did the test wrong. You did the test wrong. No, we did. We just got results you weren't expecting. Fucking deal with it. As for a null test with swapping tubes, our looper or ramp box for maximum repeatability. They could not null completely do a tiny, a little bit earlier or later saturation point, but I suspect the difference you're going to get is going to be like negative 70 to negative 80 dB, if there will be any. Highly questionable anybody would hear that. Well, dude, just so happens that's exactly how I'm going to do it. I have the signal art reamp box here. This thing's absolutely incredible. It's the best reamp box on the earth. And I've worked with a lot of reamp boxes over the last 15 years. I always get the best results I've ever got with a, with a signal art. It's absolutely incredible. Now, I'm going to say something that's probably going to be a little bit more controversial than, than a lot of things. And that's the biggest contributor to the guitar sound is pretty much where you put the mic on the speaker. And you move it a couple of millimeters, that's going to make a massive difference. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you guys in the video as well and show you exactly what the hell is going on. So... Just to make things repeatable and we're only isolating the tubes, I'm also going to be using one of these. Torpedo Captor X. So we're going to take the possibility of bumping a mic out of the equation completely. This is a reactive load box. And we're going to record the signal right off the amp and use the same impulse response on all the tests. That way, that whole speaker slash mic placement thing isn't called into question. So we're going to have completely repeatable results. Results with the ultimate goal being we only isolate the change of the tubes and absolutely nothing else. Of course, there's going to be people who are going to bitch, oh, you're using a load box. It has to be through a speaker. And to those people, they like to say, shut the fuck up. 
What is the point of changing tubes when people still listen to music with their cheap-ass headphones or through their phone speaker? So people who spend all their time on guitar and amp forms can feel important. It is well known in longest times that two changes in amps make a difference. It does not matter what the resolution of your video is, honestly. Biasing makes a difference too, and without that, your results will not be accurate because you are not accounting for all the variables. I'll watch it, but I'll know, but I will know that your findings, whether they reflect known reality or not, will be suspect because of lack of accuracy in testing methodology. Dude, I just explained how I'm going to isolate the tube in the situation so that's the only variable and not just part of it. Because, you know, a lot of tube swap tests that I've seen, it's like the guy is playing differently every single time, and that, of course, is going to affect the outcome. When you start reamping, you get the same performance. When you use a reactive load box, you are taking the cabinet and microphone out of the equation. So once again, you're isolating the tubes. You're absolutely correct though, biasing an amp will change the sound. That's why I have two 5150s. I've got one with the fixed bias original, and then I have one with the bias mod, which allows me to dial in however I want the amp biased, but I usually hand that off to my very good friend, Jay, Jay Swatman, because he knows what the hell he's doing. Please make sure you're tuned in. I, I understand you have your own preconceptions and you think I'm going to fuck this up somehow, but uh, given that set of circumstances, if you can find any flaws in it, I'd rather hear from you now than after I do the test where you say, oh, you should have done this, you should have done this. You got a suggestion for how to make this test better. Believe me, I am all ears. Will we hear anything back? I'm going to say probably not until after the test so he can show us all how brilliant he is. Hey everybody, this episode is brought to you by my favorite place to get online mixing tutorials, and that's Pro Mix Academy. We've got a really great one from Chernobyl Studios this week. It is Mixing Extreme Metal. Now, Chernobyl Studios is headed up by my good friend Scott Elliott, and if you guys remember, last summer he released that absolutely incredible lesson guitar tone mastery where he took you through all the different facets of getting amazing tones out of amp sims and showed you how you can get a raging tone without even changing any of the knobs on the virtual amp because it's all down to how you eq your cabinet impulse very cool stuff he's got an amazing methodology for figuring out how to make that work and if you haven't got it i'd highly recommend but i recommend getting it with this lesson which is mixing extreme metal that's going for 87 bucks it's a 10 hour lesson and you can get both of them this week for like the next nine days for 147 bucks now what makes this lesson special is that it's not only about mixing it's about pre-production and scott shows you how to go through all the drum edits how to layer in samples manually to kind of fix up blast beats and stuff like that kind of a necessary evil this day even though i can't stand doing it uh scott will show you how because you're probably never we're going to see how to do it on my show. If you have clients coming in who play a lot of blast beats, it's probably a really uh, cool skill to pick up and you can, because you're probably going to need it at some point. Anyway, I definitely recommend checking it out. And if you want to know more, uh, we're going to have a interview video with Scott where he kind of takes us through the whole thing and shows what's going on. It's going to be really cool. That'll be out tomorrow. Anyway, grab this lesson while you can. And like I said, we've got the double shot lessons with that and guitar tone mastery going for 147. That's only going to be available this week. Anyway, check it out. Links in the description below. Now back to the show. Clickbait rubbish. It's not a one-size-fits-all world. As has been accurately stated here by Manny, tubes won't make a lick of a difference in a high distortion situation. Geez, the music is already numbingly similar enough. Why would the equipment be any different? But I'm an older fellow. Yeah, big shock. I play through vintage blackface Princetons, mostly clean and not at deafening volumes. I promise you, upon my soul, you can readily tell the difference between tube substitutions. When I installed NOS telefucking tubes in the preamps or Amperex Bugle Boys, I knew what the fuss was about. I dare you, put some of those in a good amp, I will argue less about power amp tubes, then pull them out and put in some cheap Chinese replica. If you can't hear the difference, that's God telling you to play metal. Okay, I just want to make this really clear is that if you think there's a god out there who pays attention to you every single day and really gives a fuck about what you're doing with your genitals, then you're probably going to fall for the myth that somehow changing out tubes is going to have any kind of significant impact on your tone. Then again, I don't know. I'm willing to put that to the test because that's what great tests do. They show you you are wrong. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to be like, wow, you know what? I fucking learned something. I didn't just assume because that seems to be the popular opinion. I want to do null tests to see what happens. And of course, you know, the thing about, oh, well, new old stock telephone. Okay, here, let me stop you there, Mr. Tube Aficionado. I have a 1966 trainer with the original tubes in. How about I take the preamp tubes out of that? and drop in a set of shoe gangs. Let's see if the Chinese tubes really make all that big of a difference compared to the original made in America, quote unquote, awesome tubes. 
will it really have any kind of significant impact that, that's worthy of dropping hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on vintage tubes? I'm gonna, I can only speculate that probably not, but again, let's do the test, let's measure the, the difference and see exactly what the hell happens. Very curious. I am beyond excited to hear some tube swap null tests. I'm a huge fan of debunking tone myths with irrefutable science, like the guy who measured the differences in sweet frequency response between modern resistors and vintage carbon resistors. The difference was so slight and definitely not worth arguing about, and the difference only appeared above 25 volts, so it's completely pointless in 9-volt guitar pedals. But, 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 but that didn't get the results I wanted! Vintage resistors are better! Everybody says so! Science, motherfuckers, it's a thing. Look for it next week. I understand tubes not sounding different through the same amp and cabinet, but the cabinet is really where the different sound comes from because of different speakers. Am I correct? We've got a winner here. Mark, you're awesome, dude. Yes, you nailed it right on the head. You know, for um, the amount we blather on and on and on and on about vacuum tubes and tone wood and other bullshit that really doesn't make any difference, the single biggest difference in your guitar sound is going to be from the speaker because that's where the sound comes from. You go from a vintage 30 to a greenback to say like a WGS veteran 30 to the green beret. Yes, there are going to be some pretty major differences in tone. If you guys check out the new speakers coming soon from Amperion, those things are fucking unreal. And the tone is magical and you haven't heard that sound anywhere. I'm like, you want to hear what a vintage 30 sounds like? Turn on any freaking modern metal record because nobody's got a fucking imagination anymore. Celestian Creambacks, there, there's a different sound there. there. There's all kinds of wonderful tube options, and you're going to get far more significant results than fucking around with preamp tubes. Forget the mod. Consider a BBE Sonic Maximizer. You can thank me later. That is probably the single worst advice I've ever seen given on this channel. If somebody tells you to get a BBE Sonic Maximizer, you have my permission to slap that person, because that's just fucking stupid! Those things sound like fucking garbage! Ugh! What's up with hanging condenser mics upside down? Benefits? Is it possible? All mics? Dangers? Hey, Chris, that's a fantastic question. I'm sure you guys have all seen that in movies where they hang condenser mics upside down. It's only really a necessity with tube mics, especially really expensive vintage tube mics. Because uh, here we go. Here's a Rode NTK, and he tubes generate heat. So what you want to do is you want to hang the, the mic upside down so the heat travels upwards and away from the capsule so you don't cook it. Because capsules are delicate things. That's the whole methodology there. So if you got yourself a really awesome tube mic you'd like to last over the years, yeah, hang it upside down. It'll probably last a whole lot longer. I don't know how much of a difference it's going to make. I don't know how much heat those tubes really kick out, but better safe than sorry. But if you're using something, say, like a vintage U87, like this one here, uh, you're absolutely fine you know, hanging it normally because this is a solid state mic and you don't have to worry about cooking the capsule. So it's just basically for tube mics. Really glad you asked, though. I'm glad I could uh, show that off for you. This is interesting, even if I'm really not into analog EQs right now, but just wanted to say that, man, I need that snare sound in my life. Now, Xavier, thank you so much for the compliment on that. I got to give Jackson Ward credit for recording that. He did an absolutely stellar job. He works at a studio in Indiana these days, and he's just uh, knocking it out of the park. The guy's not only an incredible world-class drummer, he's an incredible world-class drum engineer. It's one of the reasons why we get along so well. Now, I'm going to do a breakdown video on that in a few weeks, but I'm going to be doing something over the next few days, and that's going to be getting some fundamental uh, recording lessons available for you guys for download. It's going to be a three-parter uh, EQ compression and snare, just kind of like the overall basics, explaining how everything works and then works together so you guys can get a grasp. So when I start doing a mid to advanced level tutorial like that, on YouTube, you guys will understand what the fuck I was actually going on there. So if you're interested in that, please, hey, leave a comment below. Let me know that you guys want to see some fundamental lessons that you can just download and reference anytime you want. Please let me know. I would love to hear from you. Purchase validation is pointless. Nothing will ever, ever make me believe my Gibson was worth saving up for a few years back. The thing is an expensive headache and always has been. Should have bought a Yamaha SG instead. Kidding yourself on bad is good will ultimately hold you back. Remember, kids, if a stranger offers you a Gibson, just say no, then fucking hit them with it. I would agree to a point. I mean, like, there's definitely been some whole drama coming out of the like, Gibson Custom Shop, and I hope to have somebody who used to work there on the show at a, sometime in the near future, because I think that'd be a really interesting story to be told. 
I can't say I'm super impressed with what's coming out from Gibson these days. I mean, me and Colin Scott did something at TGU last year with the new Gibsons. They were they were decent. They were they were good. Are they worth their asking price? I don't know. Whereas you know, I do have a Fender American Ultra Strat, and that thing is just absolute pure perfection in so many ways. I'm just was just that guitar just caught me completely off guard. It blew me away by just how fucking awesome it was. Anyway, I got a review coming up on that real soon. Let's just put it this way: I usually tune all my guitars to CGC FAD. Or, you know, seven-string tuning, that kind of stuff. This one, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to leave this the way it is because it is just fucking amazing like this. A lot of fun to play as well. Now, uh, you mentioned Yamaha guitars, and, I, you know, I always hear Warren go on and on and on endlessly about how great Yamaha guitars are. And I actually sat down and played with one of his over the summer, and I got to say, I think he's right. The Yamaha stuff is just fucking unreal. Seriously underrated. And if you're going to drop a shit ton of money on a Gibson, I don't know, there's way better ways to spend your money, like Schecter, Solar. Um, and yes, of course, check out some Yamaha stuff as well. You might be pleasantly surprised. What's up, Glenn? Have you ever considered making a tutorial on vocal harmonies and the way you approach them? And the more voices I add, the worser it sounds. I know it's worse, but it's so bad that it deserves to use that word. Remember, bass players do it worser. Anyway, yeah, uh, that's no problem, man. I'll be happy to do a lesson on how I do vocal harmonies. There, there's a few things you can do. I definitely recommend uh, checking out the Chris Lipe uh, video I did with him a couple weeks back where he talks about, you know, act like you're lifting weights. Generally, I like to back the singer off from the mic when they're doing harmonies just because they fit in way easier. If they're just singing from back here... Or even way the fuck back here. Uh, just adding that physical distance to the mic can can really make a gigantic difference. And that really sounds like a video I need to do. Um, you know what? I'm going to write this down right now in my list of video ideas. Tell you what I'm going to do, dude. As soon as I'm out of uh, quarantine, because I'm just kind of like isolating for the next week or so here at Spectre until the two weeks is over. That way, I'm not going to be a danger to society because I came from the uh, ever clean and coronavirus free United States of America. Um, I'm going to have my friend Brandon right over and we're going to try a couple pieces where maybe we do sing a couple lines and I have them harmonized and I'll show you what goes on with that whole physical distancing principle because I think it works really great and it's a wonderful way to mix vocals. Now it's time for the Daily Read! Just a bunch of self-serving contempt for your customers. You know people can record at home for nothing now, right? You sure you can afford your angry, chippy, entitled attitude? It isn't hard what you do, Glenn. But apparently basic grammar is. What the fuck, Stewie? Oh, it's not hard what I do? Great. Okay. Blow us all away. I'm eagerly anticipating what we get. Here's the thing. Anybody tells you this shit isn't hard is completely full of it. This stuff is fucking takes years to learn, especially if you want to learn how to do it without any computer enhancement or use something like Easy Mix where all the heavy lifting is done for you. If, if you're if you're happy, you know, uh, doing the microwaved TV dinner version of recording, by all means, have at it. If you want to learn some actual skills, watch the fucking show, especially my tutorials. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah, I didn't think so. The point that's being made isn't whether you can get acceptable sounds out of the Clark Technic. It's the blatant ripoff of the look of the original when the truth is it's nothing like it. That's why the null tests at the same physical settings are both valid and relevant when they're neither of those things in most of Glenn's tests. Uh, thanks for the compliment, I think. Seriously, though, I know there was a lot of people screaming their fool heads off because I didn't try and make the Clark Technic sound as good as it possibly could. The whole idea was to shoot it out against a real fucking Poltec! Did you guys miss that part? Duh! Why are you changing it to the same settings? It doesn't sound good that way. That's the whole fucking point! When you sound it up like a Poltec, it sounds fucking terrible! Are you guys missing that part? That was the underlying metaphor going on there. I'm sorry, it was too subtle for your fucking puny brains to pick it up. Now, for those of you guys who were paying attention, the, the whole point there was, if you're thinking about buying a Clark Technic, don't. It's over on the wall of shame up there for a very good reason. It fucking sucks. You guys are picking on guitarists now? Wine, wine, wine. Oh, wait, I'm not a little bitch. Keep it up. Love the videos. Wow. That's a first on this show. Mark, thank you oh so much for writing that. That really made my day. Anyway, for the rest of you guys watching the show, thank you so much for hanging out. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you hit the notification bell for that tube shootout video. If you're a guitar player, I think it's one you're really going to want to see. Uh, of course, people are going to have some issues with my testing methodology because it's going to fucking take their preconceptions and probably throw it right out the fucking window, especially when we start doing the null tests. 
But for the rest of us who actually want to fucking learn something, I'd highly recommend checking it out. Anyway, uh, one more time before I go, don't forget we've got that amazing deal uh, double shot going on for Scott Elliott's uh, Guitar Tone Mastery and Mixing Extreme Metal courses. You can get both for $147. That's only going to be around for like the next nine days. Grab it while you can. Anyway, you guys have a comment, you guys have a question about recording, mixing, just generally dealing with band bullshit, any of that stuff, I want to hear from you. Please leave a comment, leave a question below because I try and read every single one of them and I want to hear from you. So until next time, get out there and make some metal, you amazing motherfuckers.